relations between India and Afghanistan are steeped in myth and mystique of shared heritage, shared ideals, and shared dreams of history and prehistory. In ancient times, Afghanistan was known to the world as Bactria or Aryana, India as Aryavrata. It was a world without borders, and there was free flow of caravans to and fro, mixing history and folklore. India and Afghanistan are indeed traditional friends. Uh, we've had very close ties of friendship and cooperation since time immemorial. Afghanistan and India for uh, at least 2,000 years, or uh, longer than that, and, uh, have had very close ties in different fields, um, art, culture, um, uh, religion, and uh, so going back to 2,000 years ago and then in the modern time uh, these two countries have been uh, very friendly and close to each other and uh, well, all those cultural uh, rela relationships uh, particularly within 1,000, the last 1,000 years have brought these countries uh, very close to each other. See India has is well known that has enjoyed very close cultural proximity with Afghanistan. There have been old age old ties. What you have seen for last 55 years is that geographically we are separated. But these ties continue and that close affinity continues. Think of those far off times, and there is an echo of Vedic hymns and spiritual songs. The great epic Mahabharat conjures exotic images of godly figures of those days, and Gandhari evokes memories of ancient Kandhar. Zoroaster, known as Zarathustra, the prophet of Parsi religion of Persia, was born in Bactria around 600 BC. The great Sanskrit scholar and grammarian Panini was a Yusuf Sai Patan who settled in India predating Gautam Buddha. He wrote both in Sanskrit and Pashto languages. Buddhism flourished in Afghanistan, blossoming into a popular creed. The great masterpiece of Manandir, famous in India as Malinda Panu, was originally written in Old Pashto and later translated in Pali. As you know, Pashto is one of the great and ancient language of the region, which it has a direct relation, direct link with the great language of India, Sanskrit, and the great language of Arya, Ya Iran, Persian, Iran in Afghanistan. For it means uh, Pashto is the circle between these two languages. The great uh, Sanskrit grammarian, which uh, he wrote the first grammar in Sanskrit in the world, he was the first grammarian who started the idea of writing of grammar, Panini. But on origin, Panini is also mentioned to this point in also. He brought some words from Pashto language and also he replaced in his masterpiece, Ash Adhayai. There is so many words, so many structure from Pashto language which you accepted in the people of India and uh, the, the society of India and the in Hindi language, in Sanskrit language, has accepted us uh, like uh, his own part. For example, the word of Likna. This is originally, it is not in the Vedic uh, 
Sanskrit, the Vedic uh, period in Sanskrit language. After the coming of Panini, it, uh, this word is also uh, came and uh, replaced in the Hindi and also Sanskrit language. Like this, so many words we can find in uh, Sanskrit language, which uh, Panini replaced and brought from uh, Pashto language. In, after Panini, the second masterpiece is the discussion between the great uh, Greek Indian emperor Menander, which is called in India Malanda Panu. This masterpiece was also the first in the original discussion was between Manandar and Nagasena, the Buddhist monk. It was originally in Pashto language. We have hundreds of uh, Buddhist sites belonging to um, uh, first, second, and third uh, um, centuries. And uh, in many of the provinces of the country, there are tens of uh, Buddhist sites, and uh, many of them ready for excavation. Uh, unfortunately, we lost uh, those two in the famous statues, and not only those statues. We, during Taliban, hundreds of uh, statues were broken in Kabul Museum, and but still we have uh, many other uh, intact sites. Uh, most of them belonging to Buddhism civilization. The Greek rule came with Alexander the Great, who was fired with the dreams of conquering the then known world. Alexander's own stay in the region was short-lived and he put Seleucus to establish monarchy in Afghanistan and northwestern parts of India. But soon, the great Mauryan dynasty took over and Seleucus came under its tutelage. But of much far-reaching import was the consolidation of Buddhism in the 1st and 2nd centuries BC. Buddhism did not establish itself as a religious cult, and indeed, it ushered in revolution of ideas based on eightfold moral code of conduct for humankind. Buddhist monasteries and stupas stand witness to this day as harbinger of a great civilization phenomenon in India as in Afghanistan. The significance of this cultural and social intermingling did not lie in making imperial conquests or invasions, but in evolution of a cultural value system through peaceful means and people-to-people -people interaction. These socio-cultural values helped Afghanistan evolve as a multicultural, multiracial, liberal society, for which India too is known as a cradle of civilization. Islam made its advent both in India and Afghanistan in the 7th century AD. The event was remarkable in its peaceful overtones. The Sufi Islam brought a message of peace and goodwill away from the ignoble strife of invaders and ambitious adventurers. In Afghanistan, Islam became a dominant creed with its universal appeal of human equality, justice and peace. The empire builders stood on the other side of the fence. Ghaznavids and other dynasties in between 10th and 13th centuries exploited religion for their expansion. Mongols and Timurids followed in later centuries, and while their conquests helped them establish their dynasties, the people of both Afghanistan and India bore the brunt. There were two major strands, one political and the other liberal and integrative. The great Sufi saints drew deep on the fountain of knowledge and learning, both in Afghanistan and India, with their ingrained ethos of tolerance and liberalism, an interpretation of differing religious systems in this light.
you know, uh, Sufism creates a direct uh, tie between human beings, heart and God. And uh, it changes many things in your eyes. So you will love uh, uh, the universe, you will love human being, regardless of religion or color, or nationality or any other difference. Uh, probably you know that uh, Afghanistan or Middle Ages Khorasan was one of the main centers of Islamic Sufism. <coughs> and many of uh, Islamic Sufis uh, left Khorasan for India. Mm, and uh, they are famous now in, in, in uh, the subcontinent. Uh, like Muhinuddin Chishti or, or Baba Farid or, or Nizamuddin Awliya and many others. And I think they were uh, uh, our best ambassadors, ambassadors of the nation to uh, our Indian friends. And their messages were messages of humanity and love and peace and harmony among uh, uh, human beings' activities. And uh, the uh, Sufism centers are uh, in, in Dari, in Farsi language. It's called Hanukkah. And still we have uh, many Hanukkah centers of different sects of Sufism. No. شخصیت والایی که به نام دادا گنجبخش معروف است امو علی اجویری است که اصل از او از غزنی افغانستان است تشریف میبرن در لاور اونجا در مسند ارشاد میشینن و بعد از وا حضرت خواجه معین الدین چشتی سم اجمیری که فعلا مزار مبارکشان در اجمیر قرار داره در اجمیر هندوستان و تشریف میارن به هند از طریق بخارا و غزنی و باز به لاهور وقتی که شما امروز در لاهور تشریف ببرین اجری از به نام چلخانی حضرت خواجه معین الدین چشتی این در موقع است که حضرت دادا گنج بخش دفن می باشند بعد از او حضرت خواجه معین الدین چشتی مامور می شن که بین به اندوستان و در راه سفرشان به اجمیر در لاهور اینجا چله می کشن عربهین تیر میکنن یعنی اولین شخصیت از روی تاریخ در شبکاری هند از دت دادا گنج بخش علی یجویری است The uncertainties in the wake of attacks from outside undeniably disturbed the prevailing tranquility and peace in both Afghanistan and India. The people as such did not allow the social and cultural equilibrium to be disturbed. The commonality of socio-cultural values, on the other hand, strengthened their mutual bonds. The interaction in the literary field created an impact on the common folklore, and in this give and take, Sanskrit and Pashto words came to be used in common parlance. The first Pathan dynasty to rule over the Delhi throne began with the Khiljis, followed by the Lodi dynasty. They were no strangers to India since Peshawar in those days was part of Afghanistan. 
By and large, the Pathan dynasties ruled with a measure of liberalism, with whom India's own rulers as well as the people found much in common. The Mughal king Babur established his own dynasty after defeating Ibrahim Lodi in the Battle of Panipat in 1526. He did not live long and died in 1530 in India. But earlier, Babur had taken control of Kabul as far back as in 1504. The Afghans did not give up their resistance to alien rule and Bayazid Roshan raised the banner of revolt dying in the battlefield in his fight for Afghan freedom. Roshan's legacy of defiance lived on and to this day no big power has been able to establish its rule in Afghanistan. Babur's son Himayun was a tolerant king but his greatest handicap was the repeated revolt by his own brothers against him. It was then that the great Pathan warrior Sher Shah Suri overthrew Himayun, forcing him to flee to Persia. Sher Shah Suri was a great builder and with his humble origins, he embarked on a program to bring relief and succor to the common man. He built a great road linking Peshawar with Calcutta and even beyond. The British named it the Grand Trunk Road, while today, in free India, it is known as Sher Shah Suri Mark, running from Amritsar to Calcutta, winding its way through Sher Shah Suri's beloved Sasaram, where he was born and lies buried. Two years before, the Prime Minister of India declared from Lal Kala that the reforms the reforms which we have started on the Shir Shahi period, on the Shir Shah's period, till we have not completed that. That is the fact. Shir Shah was born in India. He was Patan, he was Afghan, but he was Indian. He was king of this country, this great nation in this great society. However, Sher Shah Suri's rule was short-lived due to his early deaths. His grandson, who succeeded him, proved to be a poor substitute. Humayu watched these developments from Persia and marched towards Delhi to avenge his defeat. Humayu succeeded in his quest and re-established the Mughal rule in India. He made Delhi as his abode, but died somewhat ironically in the precincts of the fort built by Sher Shah Suri. Humayu met his end while climbing down the stairs where he had set up a library which retained the name of its builder and is even now known as Shergadi. Thus began the rule of the Grand Mughals. Humayu's son Akbar assumed the title of emperor and ruled for almost five decades. Akbar was a great reformer and connoisseur of arts, culture and literature. Fifty years is a long time to rule, and Akbar ascended the throne when he was still a minor. Guardian Bairam Khan and his foster mother Mahamanga ruled on his behalf, but Akbar got rid of his dependence on the two as soon as he came of age. He expanded his empire far and wide, and his policy of religious tolerance won him wide acceptance. He took possession of Afghanistan and put a governor there. Little did he know that one day his own great-grandson, Aurangzeb, would set at naught many of his achievements. Popular resentment coupled with those of influential chieftains plunged the empire into perpetual turmoil. The emergence of Shivaji Maratha, proclaimed the king of his domain, encouraged the great Afghan freedom fighter Kushal Khan Khatak in Afghanistan to get in touch with him and invite Shivaji to join hands and fight the tyranny of Aurangzeb. The Mughal rule lasted for more than 300 years, but amid these internecine rivalries and warfare, the flowering of Indo-Mughal genius reached its zenith. This is reflected in the grandeur of the red forts in Agra and Delhi, Fatehpur Sikri, and the architectural excellence of the Taj Mahal in Agra, as well as in the realm of poetry and literature, which flourish side by side. These rulers 
come have come from uh, Afghanistan, and they were uh, settled down here from Afghanistan. The culture of Afghanic uh, of emphasis, of Afghanic impact, and Iranian culture was ruled by this Muslim state. And the song and dances are prohibited in Islam. There is a some cultural concert you may call a temperamental tuning system that is called a charbethi system. It is not prohibited because it was played on a square. It is called uh, charbethi. It has an impact of culture, Irani culture and Afghanistan culture. That from Afghanistan and Iran, it was instituted in Tonk which is called Charbet, it is not prohibited in Islam because it was played on duff, a single-sided drum. It is called tambur. tradition had played a crucial role in fostering unity of hearts between the people of India and Afghanistan. Khwaja Moinuddin Chishti arrived in the 12th century and settled down in Ajmer. He was followed by a regular order of Chishti saints like Khwaja Qutbuddin Bakhtiar Kaki, immediate successor of Garib Nawaz, who lies buried in Meroli, with Baba Farid Gang Shakkar as a spiritual successor. Baba Farid's Sufi hymns form part of the Granth Sahib of Guru Nanak, the founder of the Sikh religion, who visited Kabul and other centers in Afghanistan. This completed the mosaic of peaceful coexistence of Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs in the country. Garib Nawaz himself was preceded by Saint Ali Hajveri and significantly all these illustrious preceptors crossed into India from Afghanistan. Sufism became a popular religion, equally attracting Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs. The great saint Mujaddad al-Fsani came 1,000 years after Prophet Muhammad, bringing the message of Islamic Renaissance at Sirhind in India. His mausoleum at Sirhind attracts devotees of all faiths, Hindus, Sikhs, and Muslims. The tombs of Amir Yaqub Khan and Shah Zaman of Afghanistan stand near the venerated Saint's Mausoleum, popularly known as Rosa Sahib. کیا جائے لہذا اسے اپنی خواہش کے مطابق جب اس کے مریدین اس کے وہاں کے افغانستان کے جو اور دیگر حضرات خاندان کے جو تھے ان کے وہ اس کو یہاں لے کر آئے اس کی ڈیڈ باڈی کو تو لہذا یہ میرے پردادہ صاحب خلیفہ سیم حسین صاحب کا زمانہ تھا جب یہاں ان کے لائے گئے انیس سو تیئیس میں ان کو یہاں دفن کیا گیا There is an interesting Afghan connection in as much as Shah Zaman's brother, Shah Shuja, is said to have presented the world-renowned diamond Kohinoor to Maharaj Ranjit Singh, then governor of Punjab, in a historical gesture. This was a time when the Bhakti movement had taken firm roots in India, influenced by the Vedantic philosophy. The saintly class on both sides kept themselves away from royal influence, devoting their time to work for the humble and poor. After the breakup of the Mughal Empire, many attempts were made by the rulers of princely states to unify the country. This came too late, as the British were knocking at the doorsteps to emerge as the world's foremost imperial power. The British had come to India as traders in the time of Jahangir in 17th century. Once this was done, the British turned their attentions to Afghanistan. The British fought three wars with Afghanistan, known in history as Anglo-Afghan Wars. 
But as the British and Tsarist Russia were locked up in the imperialist rivalries in the 19th century, the British military adventures against Afghanistan failed, thanks to the Afghans' indomitable courage. The British colonizers failed to achieve their objectives in the first Anglo-Afghan wars, but in their second attempt, they forced the rulers of Afghanistan to sign the Treaty of Gandomak and later the drawing up of the Durand Line. The Third Anglo-Afghan War led to the defeat of the British Army and Afghanistan won its freedom in 1919 when Amir Amanullah became the king. This also enabled Afghanistan to steer clear of the great game rivalries between the British Empire and Tsarist Russia. The point to note is that through all the ups and downs of history, crisscross international big power rivalries and internal dissensions, the people of the two countries kept aloft the tradition of mutual bonhomie and friendship. Despite the obvious handicaps of those times, trade and commerce continued to receive high priority of people in both the countries. The supply of dry fruits and carpets from Afghanistan went on uninterrupted. While Indian spices filled their markets thanks to small time traders on both sides. Even today, the fruit seller calls his grapes as a gift from Chaman, which is a place named in Afghanistan, though later appropriated by the British on their side of the Durand line. The interaction between the intellectuals and poets kept its tenor, and Amir Khusru to this day is a household name among the lovers of Persian poetry, literature and fine arts. His works have been translated into two major Afghan languages, Pashtu and Dari. Musical instruments like sitar and tabla went to Afghanistan from India, while Afghanistan introduced barbat, chund and rabab in India. The ethos of languages, culture and social fusion outlasted the impact of imperial and colonial maneuvers.